introduction. So can I welcome everybody to this meeting of the Thorsby Society. Uh, we, I regret that the current circumstances have meant that we decided that it would be best to switch this to an all Zoom meeting. But I'm very pleased that so many people, both members and non-members, have joined us for this evening's talk. And maybe before long, we'll be able to revert back to having our hybrid meetings. Can I please ask everyone to mute themselves to avoid any background noise? Uh, because it is rather irritating for everybody else if we can hear your radio or your television set in the background. If you want to ask a question or make a comment during the talk, you should do that by typing it into the chat function. At the end of the talk, you can unmute yourself and then ask your question in the traditional way. So it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Henry Irving, who is Senior Lecturer in Public History at Leeds Beckett University. He's a specialist in 20th century British history and his research interests center on the Second World War. And he's currently working on wartime recycling uh, particularly with interest to the public's response to wartime conditions, legislation and propaganda. And when I read that, I thought to myself how topical that is in the current situation in which we find ourselves. This evening, Dr Irving is going to speak on Look at This, Did You See That? Making Sense of the Leeds Blitz. So welcome, Dr Irving, over to you. Thank you very much and, and thank you to everybody uh, for joining me. Um, my, my head is full of cold, uh, so actually it's quite good that we're doing this in Zoom because it means that I don't get to infect anybody um, and it also means that I hopefully uh, get to avoid embarrassing myself and having to keep using tissues uh, in real life. But it is you know, a slightly strange setup, isn't it, these, uh, these kind of online events, but we'll do our best as we go through. I do have some slides to share with you, um, so let me just do that now. Um, and I'll do my best to explain um, any images as we go through, because I'm conscious that some of you will be seeing this on big screens, some of you on slightly smaller screens, uh, which can be a little trickier uh, if there's some detail. Um, it's also just really nice, I, I think, not just to be invited uh, to, to give this talk, but to see so many familiar faces or, or at least familiar names uh, on the, uh, the Zoom list. Uh, so I can make out members of the Forsby Society and um, people who I know are involved with organisations like the Civic Trust, the libraries, um, but also a couple of my own students are in here, which is, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions as we go through, what, as we said at the end. Um, and it's a particular delight to be in uh, addressing the Forsby Society, given that the Society is such an important champion of local history here in Leeds. Um, and this lecture is focused on the city's worst air raid, which took place on the 14th of March, 1941. By that point, the Forsby Society had been running for almost 52 years. Um, and I think that tells you something about how important the society is uh, and really the, the sort of the tradition of, of, of sort of learning about uh, and sharing needs is past. Um, I'm also grateful uh, to members of the society uh, and to the librarian uh, for sharing information about previous projects that have focused on the air raid uh, in advance of this session uh, and when the situation does allow us to um, I would encourage people to go into the Leeds library and to, to look through some of that material and um, because the primary sources themselves are incredibly important and um, so just as a starting point I mean where did this invite come from well I think it came from a student project that was completed uh, last year uh, or sort of in the run-up to the anniversary uh, of the, uh, the raid in March of this year, um, when I was working with a group of students at Leeds Beckett to create a website. Um, and this was deliberately designed to uh, mark the 80th anniversary of Leeds's worst air raid. Um, the site itself sparked connections with individuals who were either directly or indirectly affected, um, including people who had lived through the raid um, and many people whose parents or family members had done so. Um, and I am indebted to everybody who got in touch uh, as a result of this to sort of share their family story. And um, I will refer to the website a couple of times as we go through today. Um, it's very easy to locate if you just uh, type Leeds Blitz or Leeds Beckett Leeds Blitz into a search engine, it should get you there. Um, and it also includes a copy of the West Yorkshire Archive Services interactive map, um, which does its best to plot um, the known locations of bombs that fell during that raid. <laughs> 
Now, my aim this evening is not to provide a blow by blow account uh, of the raid. Um, instead, I'd like to consider um, what it meant to those people that lived through it. Um, so this is, I suppose, a social and cultural history uh, of Leeds' worst air raid. Um, I'm going to start, though, just by uh, giving a bit of context. And I think this is illuminated by these two, uh, two images from the Daily Mirror uh, on the left and the Daily Express on the right. So um, what I want to get across here is that the raid on Leeds was part of an intensification of German bombing uh, that took place during March 1941. By this point, Britain had faced six months of sustained bombing and the strains were starting to show. The wartime Ministry of Information, which was responsible for monitoring civilian morale, believed that people were coping on the whole, but they feared the situation was delicate because there was so little good news to suggest that the war would eventually be run. Um, and morale is a key concept uh, when discussing air raids because it was as much a target of German bombing as the war factories or infrastructure, the sort of physical targets. The Blitz aimed to make the lives of civilian war workers as hard as possible. And the British government saw morale and productivity as effectively synonymous. And this means that morale was particularly important in an industrial city like Leeds. Now, in March 1941, um, the Ministry of Information reported that the main factor affecting public confidence had been the renewed heavy raids on provincial cities. And these newspapers show what that looked like in practice. So the first two weeks of the month had seen raids on Portsmouth, and um, that was badly bombed five times. Uh, Cardiff was badly bombed three times, Merseyside twice, Sheffield, Leeds and Hull once each. And the night of the 14th of March was particularly devastating, with sharp attacks on Leeds and Sheffield and sporadic attacks on Liverpool, London, Plymouth, Portland, Southampton, Tipton and Tunstall. So this was really a nationwide uh, sort of uh, attack. Um, it was also the second night of a devastating raid on Clydeside. Um, and in those two nights, 1,235 people were killed 50,000 people were evacuated, and almost every building in Clydebank was damaged or destroyed. Um, it was one of the deadliest raids of the entire Blitz period, and the much smaller attack on Leeds does need to be kept uh, in proportion as a result. Um, so the raid on Leeds, it, it was nowhere near as um, heavy as, as Clydebank. Um, indeed, it was not heavy enough to be classed as Blitz, uh, because relatively few high explosive bombs were dropped. Um, instead, it was described officially as a sharp attack, uh, and it was claimed that this was brought uh, quickly under control. Um, but it did still have an impact on those who lived in the city. Um, now, the first warning uh, that the raid was about to occur um, was raised at 9 p.m. when bombers were detected crossing the North Sea. Two hours later, at around 11 p.m., a couple of aircraft flew over the city, dropping incendiary bombs. Um, and these caused fires, firstly, at Showfield's Victoria Arcade, uh, which is pictured here, um, and this is a lovely sequence uh, of photographs available on Leo. <laughs> uh, would have looked like in 1941. Um, imagine that you're standing in Dortmund Square. This is the view that you would have been facing you. Um, nevertheless, this, this arcade was hit, uh, one of the first buildings to, uh, to catch blaze, um, but so too a number of workshops in Holbeck. And this first phase of the attack um, led to uh, a, a sort of intensification around midnight, uh, with the first planes joined by others, uh, and a second wave of bombers then arriving in the early hours of the morning. Uh, and these drop more incendiaries, but also uh, high explosives. Now, the map that we created as part of the, uh, the student project, um, it showed that the pattern of the bombing was actually quite targeted. So most of the raid was concentrated on the city centre and also the industrial works of Holbeck, Lower Wortley and Armley. But most of the casualties were caused by sporadic bombing over residential areas. Uh, and in fact, the single most deadly incident occurred on Hillary Street, which is nestled just behind the Fenton pub off Woodhouse Lane. Um, and in fact, it's almost in, in view of um, our building at Broadcasting Place, uh, where Leeds Beckett's uh, history uh, sort of team is today based. Um, so on Hillary Street, a, a stick of high explosive bombs killed six civilians, uh, injured two more and led to a house fire uh, when the pressure of the explosion blew out a cast iron cooking range. Um, and this was one of those stories that was shared by uh, some descendants of people caught up in the attack uh, as a result of the student project. Um, we think that fire must have been extinguished by fire watchers, as it doesn't feature in the fire service log of the raid. Um, and that document uh, contains records of over 100 more serious fires, uh, five of which were deemed major incidents. 
Of these, the most serious was at Greenwood and Batley's engineering works um, on Armley Road. Um, this site had been turned over to the production of munitions, mostly small arms ammunition and shell cases. It was hit by an estimated 200 incendiary bombs, um, as well as uh, three small 50 kilogram explosives and a large uh, 250 kilogram uh, high explosive. Um, this attack caused a raging fire. Um, it caused a roof to collapse and burst a water main, damaging eight machines and putting the works out of action for two days. Um, a similar uh, sort of situation occurred elsewhere in the city, um, high explosives causing damage to the city's transport network, bringing down tram lines, blocking the railway, uh, and also forcing the temporary closure of most major routes into the city. The situation was further complicated by the existence of unexploded bombs, with around 10% of all German devices failing to detonate on impact. Um, and when you look at this in terms of the human cost, um, 65 people um, were estimated to have been killed, 258 injured uh, during the raid, and a further 1,943 were made temporarily homeless. So this was far less serious than Clydebank, but it was not an insignificant attack. Now, with all of that context in mind, um, I want to turn to the way that the raid was viewed by those who lived through it. Um, and I'd like to start actually by sharing a, uh, a particular source that the students used uh, during the course of the project. Um, and it's the source that gave the title of this, uh, this evening's lecture, Look at This, Did You See That? Uh, which is taken from a snippet of overheard conversation um, that was recorded from a bus journey into Leeds on the morning of Saturday, the 15th of March. The conversation was recorded by a gentleman called Arthur White, who was a mass observation diarist, um, the most prolific uh, such diarist in Leeds. Now, Mass Observation was a groundbreaking organisation that had been set up in 1937 with the aim of applying um, anthropological techniques to study British society. Um, its approach was creative, at times eccentric, and it left a very rich record, um, not just for uh, sort of contemporary journalists, but also uh, it's left a rich record for historians like me. In the late 30s, the organisation recruited a panel of volunteers who were willing to write about their everyday life, their attitudes and their emotions. Um, and as the prospect of war loomed in the summer of 1939, they were encouraged to keep a crisis diary. Um, these were continued once war was declared, and around 80 people a month submitted diaries during the period. Um, some 480 people were involved, uh, involved overall, uh, 12 of them uh, at some point writing from Leeds. Now, in 2016, the Forsby Society published this book. Uh, it's called Voices from Wartime Leads, um, and it includes the transcribed entries of three mass observation diarists. Uh, two from a husband and wife illustrates the civilian experience, while the third is from uh, a conscript soldier. It's an interesting collection, um, but it is skewed towards the early part of the war because the three diarists, like most people writing for mass observation, wrote for less than a year. And this makes Arthur White something of an exception. Uh, he wrote from August 1939 all the way through to August 1945, missing only the occasional entry. And um, he was also a frequent respondent to mass observation surveys and appears to have viewed himself primarily as an observer of other people uh, rather than as a diarist. Um, his writing contains various snippets of conversations that he'd overheard, um, as well as um, he, he, uh, sort of the use of code um, so mass observation commonly coded uh, a lot of their, their data uh, using sort of very basic codes to distinguish whether someone was a man or a woman, uh, their rough age, uh, and also their social background. Um, and the fact that he used these codes suggests that he had read some of their published studies and viewed himself as part of that organisation. Now, White himself was a business owner. Uh, he ran a, a men's outfitters in a lead suburb and had a second shop in Harrogate. Um, unfortunately, I've yet to have the chance to trawl through the whole of his diary to work out exactly where the shops were, um, but I can tell you that he was uh, 45 years old in 1941 uh, and he lived in Beeston, although the shop must have been in a North Leeds suburb because he would bus into the city centre uh, and then bus out uh, to actually get to the location. Um, and his diary was one of the sources that were used by the students when researching the Leeds raid. Um, the entry for the 15th of March is fascinating. It begins with a description of this bus journey, uh, which describes passengers restlessly trying to see where bombs had fallen. And then as the bus nears the city, White notes that it suddenly switched from its direct route and proceeded in a roundabout way to avoid blocked roads. 
He goes on to describe what he calls, I quote, a lingering smell of smoke and streets full, I quote, of broken glass that looked like the spew of a drunk. And um, at some point, uh, he seems to have alighted near City Square. He heads to a wholesale warehouse where he was taken to the top of the building to look out over the damage. And he describes the Hotel Metropole uh, as having had its roof bent in like a child's cardboard toy. He then goes on to describe the scene as being mad. Um, and like many passengers on the bus, White seems to have been shocked by the destruction of otherwise familiar spaces. Now, White's diary ends with um, a really interesting collection uh, of what he calls a conversation jumble. And these are effectively numerous snippets um, of customers' conversations from within his shop on the Saturday. Um, and they provided the students with further glimpses into the way that people reacted, um, the way that people tried to take stock and to make sense of the raid. Um, and there are a few examples here on the slide. So hopefully your screen is just about big enough to make some out. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will just point you to a couple. Um, I think when you look at these as a whole, you can see the way that gossip circulated at a time when published information yeah, was carefully Yeah. Um, Somebody's talking. Um, what we can also see in here is that most of the examples are hyper-local. So um, there's people talking about the town hall being hit, the infirmary being hit, the market, people talking specifically about their own areas. So eight people were killed in our district, the front of our house was blown away and so on. Um, although we see only one part of the conversation, the inference is that his customers were comparing their experience with the experience of others. Um, and White, the diarist, does the same. So when traveling to his Harrogate shop, he notes how amusing it was to hear people whose town had not been bombed complaining about a bad night's sleep. Now, I find this really fascinating because um, White himself had not been bombed out. There's no suggestion that he or anyone he knew had been hurt. The first he sees of the damage is when he gets the bus into town. So his experience was not actually that different than someone living in Harrogate, apart from the fact that his address was in Leeds. Um, and it wasn't just individuals like White or the customers in his shop who tried to make sense through comparison. Local newspaper reports invoked common tropes to explain to the readers what had happened, implicitly or explicitly linking Leeds into a broader story of the Blitz. The Yorkshire Post, for example, initially reported on the raid as part of its nationwide, this nationwide attack, um, while later articles drew out stories of heroism and courage that had been a mainstay of Blitz reporting since the first raids on London in September 1940. And the city's emergency authorities made similar comparisons. So the Council's Civil Defence Emergency Committee met immediately after the attack to take stock, and it circulated a special report one week later. Um, Leeds' report is on the left here with the, uh, the city seal at the top. And um, their report detailed the response to the raid and to its impact. Um, so it notes, for example, that some 4,141 air raid wardens had been on duty, that 79 fire crew had been drafted into the city from surrounding areas, um, and even that 3,131 breakfasts had been served at rest centres the following day. Um, now, this is a really good source just in terms of kind of getting a picture uh, of actually what had happened. But I think that the tone of the report is as important as the facts that it contains. So the committee were at pains to express their thanks to those who had served, and they ended by praising the citizens of Leeds for their courage and their fortitude. This should be read against the backdrop of warnings about public confidence, because when civilian morale had been seen to have broken, it was usually because of perceived failures in the official response to bombing. Now, the Leeds report itself contains no direct comparisons, but the city's emergency committee had been paying careful attention to uh, the way that other towns and cities had coped. For example, less than a month earlier, it had circulated a report from Sheffield, uh, this is the example on the right of your slide, um, about a raid that took place there on the 31st of December. The Sheffield report was far less upbeat, and it included various suggestions for practical improvement. For instance, the need to increase the number of messengers because of the breakdown of telephonic communications. The implicit message from the Leeds report was that the city had withstood the test and should take its place alongside other blitz cities with pride. And I want to suggest that this tells us two things about the experience of air raids. The first is a potentially obvious one, and that is that air raids were incredibly confusing for those people that lived through them. So the official line was that the situation had been brought quickly under control, 
The Air Ministry and Ministry of Home Security, which issued an official communique, said, I quote, a number of fires were started, but these were dealt with effectively and brought under control. The number of casualties is not large. And that was the extent of the official uh, sort of verdict on the Leeds raid. Um, however, when you look into the, uh, the sort of records themselves, um, Home Office records show that the authorities initially underestimated the scale of the raid. The communique had been issued in the early hours of the morning, enabling the news to be reported by the Saturday newspapers. But it was only later that the true scale of the raid became apparent, with the number of dead and injured rising fivefold through Saturday and Sunday. And this raises an important question of what had happened. Why had that underestimation uh, occurred? So as I noted at the beginning, the damage in Leeds was spread over a relatively wide area, um, while transport and communication lines were cut. Early in the raid, a bomb had exploded on the roof of the telephone exchange, causing 30 square metres of concrete to fall onto the switching gears. This knocked out most telephone lines uh, and left civil defence authorities reliant on messengers using motorbikes and cycles. Um, and to help me explain what impact that might have had, I'm going to share two published images. Um, one comes from uh, an air raid special uh, of Picture Post, which was a popular uh, photojournalistic magazine uh, published during the war. The other comes from a government publication, um, a small pamphlet called Frontline, that was published in November 1941. And if we'd been doing this in person, I would have been sort of sharing uh, these sources with you now. So you'll have to make do with these two uh, lovely images. And um, here they are anyway, the two diagrams. Um, these are both visual representations of the way that civil defence would respond to an incident. So the image on the left, uh, which is a bit more sort of traditional uh, in, its, uh, in its sort of pic uh, depiction, that's the one from Picture Post, what happens when the bombs fall. Um, and that on the right is from Frontline, which takes this much more graphic approach uh, with some photographs in there as well. Now, there's a lot of detail on this slide and um, I, I, you don't need to, to work out all of it. Um, but the key thing is that the response to a raid would begin at a local level. So in both cases, the first person to respond to an incident is shown as the warden. In picture posts, they are the image right at the center at the top, uh, wearing the hat with the W on it. Um, and then on the right hand side, the frontline image, uh, we've got the silhouette with the white hat responding to an incident. So the response to a Second World War bombing raid was inherently local. Um, wardens would respond to incidents, fire uh, watchers would attempt to tackle incendiaries, um, and messages would be gradually passed up a chain of command. So this would move from the individual to a warden's post, to a fire substation, uh, and then it, eventually onto a district report centre, um, in Leeds, it would go to the city's report centre and then via the headquarters of the North Eastern Defence Region, finally, it would make its way to London. So this is a sort of multiple step process of messages being passed on. Um, and we can see then um, just what this would look like in practice. So uh, here's a, a local example to maybe help with some of those uh, sort of slightly alien graphic images. And um, this is a map from Leeds Central Library, and it shows what was referred to as the D6 district, um, which covered parts of Headingley, Kirkstall and Hawkesworth. And um, so this is a, uh, a fire sub district. Um, and what is now Leeds Beckett University is located uh, just to the right of the centre, uh, listed here as uh, City of Leeds Training College. So the map shows one particular sub district. Um, listed here are six fire substations. Um, and on the night of the 14th of March, these dealt with at least four different incidents. This sub-district was just one part uh, of a wider district, uh, which covered the whole of Northwest Leeds uh, and was headquartered on Biodic Road in Kirkstall. Um, and D district, again, was just one part of a, a sort of wider uh, sort of subdivision for Leeds. There was A, B and C uh, covering variously the city centre, south of the river uh, and the northeast of the city as well. And all of these different component parts had to speak to each other during the course of the raid. Um, and on the night of the 14th, some, uh, some 3,500 messages were passed on during the raid. I say the vast majority of these passed on uh, by hand uh, by somebody on a bicycle or a motorbike. And um, it took time for these to then be passed from local sites to the central control. Um, and it took further time for them to be passed from Leeds' city control through the regional apparatus into London. To complicate matters further, it wasn't just the telephone exchange that had been hit by a bomb. The regional civil defence offices were also damaged by a blast, 
which blew out their windows and destroyed an adjacent building. And um, they did manage to maintain contact with Leeds' main control, but it's easy to understand why the full picture didn't emerge immediately. It's so gonna come back to these two beautiful images. Um, and I want to make now the, the second point. Um, so the raids themselves were inherently confusing, um, but the second argument I want to make is that the comparisons that were made after a raid were just as much about imagination as they were about experience. So the Second World War had begun in September 1939, but people had lived with the threat of area warfare for a long time before that point. Speculation about war was commonplace during the 1920s and 30s, um, and the term Second World War itself predated the conflict. Much attention was paid to what was called air power theory, the belief that future conflicts would be won or lost by the ability to endure aerial bombardment. This was an idea that had been born in Italy which was the first country to use aircraft in warfare in 1911. Um, and it was a theory that was articulated most clearly uh, by Giulio de Hay, who published an influential book on the subject a decade later. Military uh, strategists across the globe fixated on the idea of what they called a knockout blow. So rather than again risk great armies being bogged down in trenches, they imagined that future wars would be fought from the skies with aircraft used to destroy the enemy's military capacity before anyone could do anything about it. Um, and they believed that this would break civilian morale in the process. Now, all of this raised thorny moral questions. Um, speaking in a parliamentary debate about arms spending in 1932, Stanley Baldwin, the leader of the Conservative Party uh, and sort of de facto prime minister, um, warned that aerial warfare meant that the only defense is offense. Um, and I quote, which means you have to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you want to save yourself. Now, Baldwin uh, made this speech in an attempt uh, to sort of put forward his own opposition to air power spending. He was determined not to be dragged into barbarism by Mussolini and Hitler. Uh, but he also warned, chillingly, that the bomber will always get through. And this is a phrase that was commonly invoked during the 19, uh, 1930s. Historians like Susan Grazel, Brett Holman, and Richard Overy have argued that these beliefs owed as much to popular culture as they did to military thinking. Um, science fiction writers had written about aerial warfare since the advent of human flight. Um, so for example, H.G. Wells, um, who wrote uh, a book called The War in the Air in 1908, um, and remained a key figure, writing the influential dystopia, The Shape of Things to Come in 1933. Um, a book that depicted a future ravaged by weapons of mass destruction. It's impossible for me to say what impact Wells' book would have had on the citizens of Leeds, but we can be certain that people in the city had thought about the prospect of bombing. Um, and this photograph, which somehow has been horribly annotated uh, by, uh, I think, during by PowerPoint, so excuse that, um, but this photograph gives a sense of why people may have considered this a reality. Um, indeed, in a high profile show of air power in July 1936, um, the Hindenburg airship had flown low over Leeds one lunchtime, following the railway line out of the city to Eden Aerodrome. Um, and this picture shows the airship flying over the war memorial in City Square. This flight provoked questions in Parliament about hot, hostile intent and led to a ban on German flights through British airspace a year later. Um, it is a fascinating image. and. The fact that this is flying over War Memorial, I think it really does sort of, uh, it tells us something about just the, um, it, it's a really lovely sort of juxtaposition. Uh, it tells us something about the, uh, the sort of the, the feeling uh, of the age in the 1930s. And um, actions like this uh, flying of the airship convinced the British government to ramp up civil defence measures, um, at this stage referred to as ARP. And from a tentative start, the government passed the Air Raid Precautions Act in 1937, um, an act that made civil defence a statutory responsibility for so-called scheme-making local authorities. Um, direct recruitment into civil defence uh, began around the same time. Again, Leeds was at the forefront of these activities. The council had set up an ARP committee in November 1935, well before it was forced to do so. And by 1936, the committee had devised an outline scheme and its plans were shared with the public um, at an exhibition in the town hall the following summer. The city also hosted one of Britain's largest pre-war training exercises. And um, this took place in April 1938 uh, in an exercise that involved emergency service workers um, sort of training alongside the armed forces to practice their response to an air raid. 
There were RAF aircraft flying over the city, anti-aircraft guns fly, firing blanks into the night sky, and even the controlled ignition of a house on Woodhouse Moor. And um, these events were attended by about 60,000 spectators and were reported in the national as well as the local press. By the start of the war, Leeds had invested about £1.5 million in civil defence measures um, and was spending £17,000 a week on running costs. Now, it's really hard to accurately compare these because, um, I mean, it's not just inflation, but also a completely different sort of frame for the, for the cost of living. But these, um, these figures would be the equivalent of around £100 million and £1.5 million a week in today's money. Um, so again, it's just worth me saying that these are not insignificant sums. And these local initiatives sat alongside national ones. As war became increasingly likely during 1938 and 39, the government began to distribute training pamphlets, launched a large scale recruitment drive and used a variety of media to explain civil defence. The campaign ranged from cigarette cards through to a 20 minute propaganda film called The Warning that showed how different civil defence services would work together. All of these pre-war measures painted a picture of what air raids would look like and they set a benchmark for comparison. This continued during the war itself. And it is just worth remembering that by March 1941, air raids had become a common fixture in newspaper reporting, radio broadcasting and film, providing the people of Leeds with a framework to understand and articulate their own experiences. So what should we take away from Leeds's worst air raid? Um, well, I think firstly, it is important to keep things in perspective. Um, as I said at the outset, Leeds was not as badly bombed as other areas and it escaped lightly when compared uh, to the concurrent raids on Clydeside. The March raid was the city's worst, but it was probably not as devastating as some people had anticipated. However, the raid is still a part of Leeds' history, and the response to the students' project earlier this year shows how it had a lasting impact on people's lives. This was most obvious in the case of those who had died or who were injured, but the raid was also felt by those who lived through it, and um, people who maybe sat in the dark listening to bombs falling. And um, it was also felt by those who saw the devastation afterwards, people like Arthur White. Um, and it was also, I think, indirectly felt by the families of those uh, sort of who had been affected. And uh, you know, many of the people who I spoke to after the students' websites launched, um, they only had an indirect uh, sort of reference uh, to the Blitz, but they still felt it was a part of their story and part of their city story. Um, it's for this reason that I've suggested that the raid's impact was felt most uh, in a social and cultural uh, sort of sphere. Responses to the bombing also hint that it was seen as a test of the city's preparations. Leeds, a city that had been preparing for bombing since the 1930s, had finally proved the effectiveness of the measures that it had put in place. And similarly for the general population, having frequently been told that they were on the front line, and they had now experienced what they had long imagined. And the fact that the majority of people were sat through the raid in the dark, unsure of exactly what was happening, and was neither here nor there. What mattered, in the words of a passenger on Arthur White's bus, was, I quote, Leeds has caught it at last. Um, so that is a whistle-stop tour uh, through the Leeds Blitz. Um, and thank you very much for listening. I've left lots of time for questions because I know it's always uh, quite hard to um, listen for a very long time on Zoom. Um, but I look forward to seeing uh, what you take away from that. So uh, just bear with me one second and I'll stop screen sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry, for that most interesting and informative talk. Uh, I think people were listening so intently to what you said that they haven't actually typed any questions into the chat function. So I invite people who would like to do that to do that now, but who would like to ask a question by unmuting yourself and just asking it in the normal way. While people are thinking about that, can I get my question in first? How much were people of Leeds aware of the bombing in other cities, do you think? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question, and it does come round to uh, questions about censorship. So the, the Blitz uh, at a national level had been um, very widely reported, but of course the severity and the extent of the, uh, of the air raids um, had been subject to censorship, and, and it meant that people were getting a, a quite a distorted view. Um, so from September 1940, uh, people would have been aware that this was a very real possibility. 
Um, they may have heard uh, a whole range of sort of different rumours, uh, different stories about what this would mean for them. Um, but unless they had actually sort of physically witnessed this uh, in another city, they probably wouldn't have known quite what to expect. Um, but of course, Leeds was a, I mean, as a, as a large industrial centre, uh, and closely connected to other sort of regional uh, cities, people would have travelled. There would have been a little bit of knowledge. Um, but, you know, for somebody like Arthur White, you get the sense that this is the first time they've seen this in reality. Uh, and it's that that makes it so interesting. They may have seen pictures, they may have heard newspaper reports, radio reports, but I, I, they wouldn't have had the smell of it. You know, it's those sort of physical responses that emerge very clearly from the, um, uh, from the, the reporting at the time. Okay, thank you. Various people have typed questions now into chat. They're all rather technical questions about the military <laughs> aspects, and I'm not sure whether this is really your... Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I, I can do my best. I mean, in, in terms of aircraft, if I just I'm trying to answer John Steele's question in terms of aircraft, um, it's around 40. Um, so it's around 40, dropping about 25 tonnes of high explosives, um, much larger numbers of incendiaries. Um, so this is, it's, it's a relatively small rate. I mean, you know, this is not um, kind of the hundreds of aeroplanes. Um, again, in terms of airbase, that I'm afraid I don't know. Um, they, they seem to have crossed the North Sea near Hull and then flown uh, following the Humber and then following the air. Um, so I don't know, if you're better at geography than I am, you might be able to work that out. Um, and then, yeah, what was the verdict in terms of the RAF and anti-aircraft batteries? That is an important question, actually, and one which, which does come back to the social and cultural side. Um, because, of course, people wanted to feel that they were being defended. Um, and there were a huge number of rumours, actually. Um, there'd been some changes, I believe, to the anti-aircraft batteries in the week before. Um, so one had been moved um, almost, I think, maybe like a day or two days before the raid. Um, and then actually some bombs fell on that site um, during the raid itself. So the whole range of rumours about why that might have happened or what the impact might have been. Um, there was, I know, reported in the Yorkshire Post, a rumour that a German plane had been shot down, and um, that was unsubstantiated, nothing was found. Um, but certainly these rumours were, were playing around. And it's clear that civilians wanted to feel that they were being protected. Um, and this is, you know, there was a, a huge amount of, of interest in what was taking place, and particularly given um, that, you know, Leeds did seem to have this protection from uh, Eden Aerodrome, from the, the kind of RAF squadron there. And um, so these things are certainly circulating. People were, people were speculating on it at the time. Elizabeth has got her hand up. Elizabeth, if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself and then ask it. You need to unmute yourself. Hold on. Right. Um, I hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, I live in a house not far from Kirkstall Forge. And obviously Kirkstall Forge was known, as I understand it, to be a likely target for German bombing. Actually, it never was. But our house, and I presume there were others, had reinforcements put on the old stone table in the cellar, which actually are still in my cellar. No, we've never moved them since. So this is a, um, a leftover from the Second World War. What I was wondering was, do you have any other information about what physical preparations were put in place to protect properties from the possible bombing as was done in my cellar yeah fantastic question elizabeth and um nice to know that these things are still there it's um i, I mean obviously they were built to last and, and very hard to get rid of but um actually that's very common so going into uh, the second world war most of the money that Leeds had spent on uh, sort of physical measures they were precisely of this format so they were reinforced cellars um, relatively little money had been spent on uh, big public shelters, um, although some did come later on. Um, really a tiny amount of money was spent on the kind of classic Anderson shelter. Um, the vast majority was spent on reinforcing cellars. Um, and this was really common in Leeds because of the high proportion of back-to-back -back terrace houses, uh, which made it the most cost-effective uh, cost uh, sort of approach to civil defence. Um, and I know that large amounts of that, you know, it is still there, it's kind of built into the architecture. Um, so I think your cellar will not be alone. Um, there will be other examples where this is uh, where this has happened. Um, I mean, later on, you do get the building of a, a whole range of different shelter types. Um, but actually, I think for Leeds, the, the common one is still the cellar the whole way through. Um, and you do still see visual clues of this. So I know I, I live in Headingley um, and, and 
uh, one of the shops on the, uh, the the main shopping street on Otley Road, there is still an access cover that's listed. It's sort of you can see the words air raid very uh, or air raid shelter very faintly uh, embossed into that. So there are still these little clues um, of where that money went. But it was you know a huge amount that was spent on uh, on things just like that. And I believe Kirkstall Forge was um, I think it was hit in August 1942. I think the city's last raid did come as far as Kirkstall, and um, so. Yes, your house survived, um, but Kirkstall Forge not so lucky. Thank you. Uh, Jill asked the question, do we know why Leeds got off so light, relatively lightly? In yeah, it's a, again, a, a really good question. And um, there are probably people who are far better placed to answer this than I. Um, I think, I mean, look probably is part of it. Um, and... It's, it's very, very difficult to say, isn't it? Because on paper, it seems like a, a very obvious target. You know, it, it was a, a real center for war production. There's a huge amount of industry located in the city and, and you know, a whole range of different things. I mean, I think Leeds afterwards, they, they sort of, there was a lot of um, you know, internal rivalry with cities like Sheffield that had been hit more, uh, more severely, saying, well, Leeds was, you know, avoided this because it wasn't doing anything important. And um, actually, Leeds' engineering works were really turned over for war production. There was a huge amount of uh, sort of productive uh, work happening in the city. So I think partly it is luck. Um, it might be, uh, you know, geography plays into this. Um, the city relatively well protected uh, in terms of its geographical location. Um, I, it's hard for me to say, and I'm sure that others may have uh, comments on this, so feel free to put them in the chat if you know better than I do. Thank you. Uh, James Drive asks, did people know and accept that news was being censored? Uh, another fantastic question, and um, this is something that emerges again very clearly from a lot of the public responses at the time, um, that there's, there is a degree of criticism here. Um, so people knew they were being censored, um, they knew from the outset that censorship was a, a prospect, but then the government also, um, in its wisdom, launched a public relations drive from December 1940 to try and explain censorship rules. Um, so the, the chief censor gave a BBC radio broadcast on New Year's Eve, and um, people obviously didn't have parties to go to, um, and there was another broadcast um, around Easter uh, 1941. So actually the March raid, um, it, it falls into this period where the government has been much more open about how these decisions were taken. Um, they knew that there was a, a military reason for doing so, and that was relatively easy to explain, but they, they still disliked the uh, sort of scant nature of the reporting. And um, what I found fascinating though, is the way that local journalists really pushed the rules. So if you were to look at the, um, the uh, Yorkshire Evening Post edition for the 15th of March, the Saturday, um, they have, the classic censored article, northeast town hit, sharp attack, repeating the government's line. And then next to it, they have a, uh, a, an article that reads, um, Germans claim raid on Leeds. And this juxtaposition, I mean, it makes it very obvious for the reader what it is that you're, you're learning about. Um, so they knew how to push the rules. Um, but yes, um, censorship was always quite contentious. Uh, there's a question from EJK who says, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a he or a she. I remember an air raid shelter under Sacred Heart Church in Burley Road. How many air raid shelters were there in Leeds and how often were they used? Again, a, a really good question. Um, I am tempted actually. I'm sure we still have people's email addresses. So I might ask um, that when the recording of this goes out, I can share a link um, to uh, um, another map <laughs> that we made um, that tried to sort of plot the location of the big public shelters. Um, again, most of the common shelters were these uh, these basements, reinforced basements in public buildings as well as private dwellings. Um, but there were also uh, around 30 uh, sort of bigger public shelters, uh, mostly trenches dug in public parks. Um, so there's a, there's a real scattering. I mean, the idea was that you should always be quite close to a public shelter if you needed one. Um, so I can't put a precise figure on it, but they, there were plenty of them. Um, um, I had to go at plotting some of these on a map a couple of years ago, um, which gives a sense of sort of the geographical spread at least. In terms of how often they were used, again, people's behaviour changes on this. Um, and there are parallels here, I think, with COVID. So uh, to begin with, people were much more likely to go to a shelter any time an alert, you know, any time an alert rang. And um, when people realised that these were quite dark, damp places, um, when, you know, the bombs hadn't fallen, maybe they got a sense that, 
I almost that, that sort of slight sense of confidence that this wasn't going to be, uh, you know, there wasn't going to be uh, raids in quite the way they expected. People stopped going and the vast majority of people um, the whole way through the war spent more time at home than they ever did in public shelters. So although these spaces are, are reminders of that conflict, for most people, the experience of the war was very domestic. Um, and I, I mean, I mentioned you know, the, the, the real loss of life in the Leeds raid it was from families who had stayed at home. So they may have taken some precautionary measures, um, but they were killed in their kitchens or you know, under the stairs. Um, a lot of people weren't using those shelter facilities. They preferred to chance it. Um, and obviously, sadly, in some cases, um, that choice uh, led to their deaths or, or to their serious injury. John Steele asked that what you quoted one of the comments that Arthur White heard that there would be another raid the following night. Did this occur? Um, no, it didn't. Um, uh, Clyde Bank got it twice. Uh, Leeds didn't. Um, but this was, I mean, again, it's fascinating the way that these rumours spread. Um, to begin with, so around September 1940, um, reports coming out of London suggested that there was almost a sort of folk myth that the Germans would never bomb the same place twice. So if a street got hit, people um, commonly then didn't take shelter because they felt that it wouldn't happen again. So early in the Blitz, there were all of these rumours that, uh, you know, a bomb would never fall in the same place twice. By the time you get to March 1941, that seems to have changed and people are expecting uh, buildings to be hit uh, again and, and again. So um, it is interesting the way that public attitudes and behaviour shift, even in a relatively small space of time, you know, the, the sort of nine months between the start of the Blitz and the, the Leeds raid. I'm reading the questions out because I'm not sure that everyone can see what's in chat. So David Hilton asks, were all industrial centres bombed strategically in the same way? Or were there variations regionally or according to what was the nature of the industry? Were some um, industries considered by the enemy more crucial to disable than others? Uh, yes, and I, I think the, the obvious answer here is that port towns were hit the hardest. So there's a, there's a, I mean, Britain as an island importing huge amounts of material um, from all over the world, but the, the port towns really were hit the hardest. There was an attempt here to disrupt shipping uh, and to disrupt that inflow of, of vital war materials, but also things like food. Um, so to begin with, um, it's the south coast that's hit, hit most heavily. Uh, as you go into 1941, um, this shifts westwards, uh, so Liverpool becoming a, a major target because of Atlantic shipping trade. Um, so yeah, ports probably are the, the most affected. In terms of industry, um, again, transport networks are surprisingly important. So a lot of the raid on Leeds, it seemed to be aimed to take out the railways. Um, this is the same early on in the London Blitz. It's, it's the transport infrastructure that is the main target. Um, and then beyond that, you know, uh, any sort of workshop or factory is, is sort of on the firing line, but really transport's the key one. Yes, I understand Hull was very badly bombed, but for uh, strategic reasons, that was never really made public. And I think people in Hull still feel aggrieved that the their da war damage has never been sufficiently recognised by Very them. much so. Hull, Hull and Liverpool, really alongside London, are the, the, the most uh, affected. I think Liverpool gets the most... Uh, sort of the, the most human uh, casualties outside yeah, yeah. of London. Hull per capita is the most bombed place in the country. Yeah. Um, and as you say, uh, covered by censorship, referred to as a northeast town or a northeast port town. Um, and there is, I think, that, that real sense that their story was not told. Um, there have been some fantastic initiatives locally, though, uh, in recent years. Um, uh, so again, I think that story is starting to be, uh, to be shared much more widely. Um, I can see there's also there's a question in there about um, uh, about Barnbow, the Royal Ordnance Factory. And um, again, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm afraid it it wasn't targeted in the uh, in in the March forty one raid. Um, it may have been at other times. Um, and the same would go actually for the the big Royal Ordnance Factory at Boston Spa, which is now the British Library. Um, again, um, uh, I, I would have to consult uh, with with someone who knew the the kind of strategic side of it better than I do. So Alan M asked, was there any evidence that intelligence about the lead had been gathered before 1939, or was it all through area reconnaissance? Did the Germans use Bidecker references as they did for York, or did they use the Knickbein system, which is a system of rays to locate leads? Um, it, it is, so it's, it's the latter, but then also, I mean, just, you know, 
the, the sort of the visual navigation um, and the, the radon leads it, it wasn't a full moon, but I think it was the day before or the day after. So we're talking here about perfect bombing conditions, clear nights, um, relatively well lit, um, and again, able to follow river courses, water courses and railway lines. Um, so there's a degree of uh, visual navigation going on as well. Um, there is, a, yeah, there is some evidence of, of intelligence, although, I mean, it, it's important, I think, not to overplay that. It, it, this is all source material. So um, they had pre-war ordnance surveys um, and sort of offer insurance records, things that would have been marked up with what's works, what's a, you know, where, where the, uh, the kind of infrastructure is. Um, so I, I don't think there were hordes of German spies and leads in the 1930s. Um, but certainly there were, um, you know, the use of open source material. And then also, I mean, the, the Hindenburg, one of the big uh, sort of, I suppose, worries about that was that this was being used for aerial reconnaissance and that lots of photographs were being taken um, as those airships flew over. Um, as far as I'm aware, no photographs have ever been recovered, but that's not entirely surprising given the, uh, the sort of dearth of sources from Nazi, the Nazi period. Um, so it could be that actually those flights themselves were part of that reconnaissance mission. Well, the questions are piling up now. <laughs> um, so I don't, can you, I don't know whether you can see them all, but David Hilton asks, is there an audio archive of people's memories of these events? Um, great question. Um, not that I'm aware of. So, uh, th I mean, there are various sort of things out there. If people are interested, um, the, the, I mean, I, locally, I could say the Second World War Experience Centre, which is now based in Otley, and um, they do have oral, uh, oral records as well as uh, as written testimonies. Some, I think, have been digitised. Um, other than that, the, the BBC uh, at the turn of the century, uh, this century, did a, uh, a, a sort of a, 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 an internet-based archive called the BBC People's War, mostly, again, written transcripts, but a couple of oral things. Um, so there is some material out there, but it's, it's drips and drabs. And what we tried to do with the students was to bring some of this together, because I sort of know where the sources are. You know, I, This is my job. I'm paid to know where those things are. Um, but we wanted to bring it to a wider audience. Um, so have a look at the, the lead split site. And then, um, you yeah, know, we are hoping to keep adding to that over the, over the years as well. And, and yes, in fact, I can see Sue has put the World War II Experience Centre yes. does have an audio archive. Um, so I'm glad that we're both on the same page there. So Lucy Evans asked, did the bombing spark off any attacks on people suspected of spying or being jerk? Oh, good question. Um, by this stage, actually, that is far less common. So um, it, it's really May 1940, it's sort of the, the height of the invasion scare that this becomes most pronounced. Um, and I think there are definitely cases in Leeds where, 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 you know, people who were in turns, I mean, particularly Bradford, which got a larger German population. Um, but actually, by the time you get to the, the bombing, a lot of this has subsided. Um, so there's, by this point, it's almost become expected it's commonplace whereas i think earlier on there was a lot of fear and sort of uncertainty and that's where these reprisals came from um, but i've not seen any evidence of that at this point lucy so various people have now typed into chat some some links to where they can find archive material so that's yeah and i can that's I, again as well as see that i can see jackie de who probably yes. again both use this from a family history perspective so there's, there's definitely material out there um, and they say it's been invaluable for me as an academic historian, but it's also you know, invaluable for anybody that wants to go away uh, and find out more about either their, their family's history or the, the city's history. And um, as I said, this is, I think, a very important moment for many people, even though it doesn't quite sort of, you know, uh, meet the same threshold as, as London, Liverpool or even Hull. We are coming towards the end of our time, but does anybody want to ask a question either orally or type it into chats? David Hilton's asked another technical question. Did all the bombs go off or were there a large number of unexploded bombs? Yeah, and that's that's a really, really good question, actually. Again, it, it, it links from the strategic to the actual way that this would have been experienced because um, I, I, I mentioned uh, in the talk, but I was probably going too quickly, about 10% of German bombs did not explode yeah. on impact. Um, so that means that a very large number actually um, had to be dealt with thereafter. Now, some of this was deliberate. Um, so the use of time bombs that were designed uh, to explode, at, you know, sort of varying intervals after they'd fallen. And in other cases, it was just because they failed uh, failed to, to detonate. Um, but yeah, the, one of the things that I, I saw through the, uh, 
the, the map through the uh, the Home Office sources, but then also through some people's recollections, um, is that a large number of unexploded bombs did cause havoc. Um, because it's this that usually led to people being made temporarily homeless, yes. and had to leave the surrounding properties. Um, and it also caused real damage for the transport infrastructure because it was basically impossible to reopen a road whilst there was that thick, that threat. Um, they had to be dealt with by the Home Guard. Um, and certainly one, uh, one individual who got in touch after the website launched, um, someone who's now living in New Zealand, um, they remember stumbling across one of these bombs uh, on uh, Whitehall Road uh, in the early hours of Saturday morning um, and then alerting the Home Guard who came to sort of fence the area off. Um, so I think that would have been a very common experience, actually, going out and sort of finding the remnants of this raid uh, in, in the following hours. And, and I can see somebody said that an incendiary device was indeed yes, found yes. in their garden. Um, a, a huge amount of shrapnel, various bits and pieces. And again, you know, people would go out and find this. You know, children would go out and sort of collect souvenirs uh, following the raid, um, some of which I, I think probably continue uh, to be in people's personal uh, sort of family collections to this day. Okay. Any, any final questions anyone would like to ask? Okay, well, can I just end the meeting, first of all, Henry, by thanking you for your most informative and interesting talk. And I think you can see from the large number of questions that it generated how interested people were in what you had to say. And people are now typing in thank yous into the chat function. Uh, so very grateful to you for giving up your time speak to us and for giving us such an interesting lecture which told us a great deal about Leeds which I think many of us didn't know so thank you very much for that can I just then end the meeting by saying this is our final meeting of this year we will circulate information about our meetings in January early in the new year so I'd just like to end by wishing everyone a very merry Christmas and a happy and healthy new year good night <laughs>